Grr. Arg. It's time for the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. I have finesse coming out of my bottom. And Rish Outfield. I'm finished being everybody's butt monkey. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 85. I am your excellent host, Rish Outfield. And I'm your very far from excellent host, Big Anklevich. And by the tone of our voices, you know that it is the Halloween season and that we are extremely non-creative. Anyway, we do have a story today. (laughs) And this is a sequel we like to do sequels here on the show. I like prequels. Okay. I am happy to let you know that this is a prequel. Oh, are you serious? I am serious as a high heel to the groin. Oh, wow. That's pretty serious. You add your share of high heels to the groin in your day, Irish outfield. Okay. Yeah, last year we did a story. In fact, it was the Broken Mirror story. Chemo, the town of Golden Woods. Oh, yeah. That was was, a good story. It was uh, a very interesting action, horror, sci-fi production. I I think it was well-received. This year, we've got the prequel to that. Chemo, colon, The Condemned. Ooh. Now, I think this story sets itself up fine. You don't have to have listened to the other one first to enjoy this story. But... If you'd like to check out that other story, we'll have a link to it in the show notes. And also, it's a story we did in September 2009. That's right. And this story is written by J.M. Perkins. J.M. Perkins, aside from already appearing on the Dune Steve, uh, he has previously appeared in Alien Skin Magazine, 365 Tomorrows, Micro Horror, Flash Shot, and The Drabblecast. We'd like to thank Brian Lincoln, who produced and edited today's story, and Lizanne Hurd, Ray Saltrelli, Nicole Suddeth, Bukis and Gomez of the AIE Raid wrap-up podcast, and Brian Lincoln for lending their voices to today's story. Today's music was by Mr. M. Check out the links for everyone in the show notes. Okay, so without much more ado... Here comes Chemo, the Condemned. Chemo, the Condemned, by J.M. Perkins. When you fire your weapon, do not shoot as the heathens who think for their many bullets they will kill. The Book of Chemo, chapter 16, verse 23. The prison loomed before us like a fortress. Inhuman noise filtered out through the barred windows. I did not shudder at the screams of the dying or the lingering whispers of the dead and damned. I reminded myself that I should not know fear from the sounds of the condemned. With tooth and nail, with gun and blade we come. We sang the opening to Chemo's seventh battle hymn. I raised my voice above any of my fellows. We were conditioned to use the chanting rhythm as a biofeedback mechanism, to lessen fear and sharpen ourselves to battle-ready focus. I needed it to work now. I suppressed the urge to shit my pants, continued to stand as still and rigid as I could manage. I thought that's what they wanted. Our trainer paced back and forth before our little gaggle of men and women, fresh agents all, Even after all the psych exams, the conditioning, and run-throughs, we didn't have a clue just what we had gotten ourselves into. Well, boys and girls, are we ready for our mission? I can see by your fear that this is the first time for about half of you, said Instructor Jones. I remembered his words from before, as he had raised his voice over the rattling of our ancient cargo plane. I'm not some dumbass from your full metal jacket Master Sergeant wet dreams. They need discipline and stamina in the Corps, and they have a duty to try and make men out of whatever milk shops float their way. We take 
take what we can get and let nature sort things out for us. Much less stress that way. He had roared to be heard over the sound of the engine. I had looked around me at the other nine. I smiled, hoping to have their reassurance that this was a joke. A terrible, terrifying joke. The other agents cast their eyes down. I shivered then. And I was shivering now that we stood before the high-walled complex. Rain began to fall, steaming off the bright, hot floodlights we used to beat back the night. Your task today is to reclaim this wayward place for humanity. You are going to scour this prison of every scrap of cancer with what you have on hand and what you can scavenge. Standard issue battle array. Assault rifle, ten clips, collapsible baton, knife, accelerant, and your own preferred accessories. But plus your brains. You think you can handle it? I wanted to shake my head. No, no, I couldn't. I kept quiet. Good, he said, assuming the silence was acquiescence. The threat du jour is zombies. The running, angry kind. Technically, they're individuals infected with the S20N3 strain of rabies, but zombies gives you a better idea of what you're up against. Bleeding doesn't affect them like it does us, and most of their internal organs do not matter much to them anymore. So aim for the head and pray that you're smarter than they are. The past several months of chemo conditioning had held one paradigm bomb after another. The existence of zombies rated low on my new expanded revelation meter. One of my fellow agents, a ramrod former Marine by the name of Elijah Cuthbert, spoke up. Sir, wouldn't it be easier to send in some armor or just blow the whole place up? This is horror movie 101. Why send in vulnerable infantry when you could just use APCs that the things can't bite through? Agent Cuthbert, I'm impressed. It is fucking rare that an agent I'm conditioning thinks for themselves or suggests anything remotely sensible. Jones shook his head. It is a shame you're so fucking wrong. You are assuming that we have armor to spare for something as insignificant as bitey pissed off humans. In similar fashion, you are assuming we want to keep you out of danger. So no, and also no. Armor is important, and you are not. Our number one goal is to further condition and winnow the lot of you. So we send in lightly armed infantry to see who's fit for chemo. Our secondary goal is to get this facility up and running within the week. So we send in lightly armed infantry so the place will be more or less useful once we're through here. Why else do you think the authorities are only too happy to look the other way? He smiled, a large, terrifying smile. He slapped Cuthbert on the back like they were old buddies. Now get a move on. We all fumbled with our weapons one final time, metal slick in the precipitation. We extracted and inserted clips, clicking the tabs to make sure our safety showed red. Anything to keep our hands busy, keep the nervousness at bay. Good luck, he said. We walked past the concrete barriers dotted with machine gun nests toward the howling inner dark. Our support crew had already forced the gate, rusted metal screeching over every inch. We marched through the entrance, every footfall careful and slow. Agents in carapace-like armor so thick they could barely move had taken over the guard posts in the towers and along the outer walls. They stood above us, multi-barrel miniguns at the ready, watching. We moved on through the outer gate. Between the perimeter wall and the prison proper, there was a thick layer of the dead. We were forced by necessity to noisily stomp over the corpses of all the condemned who had been slain by the still-steaming miniguns. Agent Cuthbert and Agent Gregg led the way. They held their guns aimed down, scanning for any tick or twitch from our macabre carpet. I heard one of their guns burp out three rounds as they stilled some body. It might just be after-death jitters, but who would take that chance? The water pooled and mingled with the blood, softening the crunch of our boots to soft squishes. It was like walking over landmines they had told you were decommissioned. Or mostly decommissioned. Sure, we trusted the men who had cleared the way, but trust only took you so far. Praise the Lord, smile at your neighbors, and pass the ammunition is what I had always been taught. Fifty more steps and a handful of bullets, and we reached the door to the prison interior. As we entered the black tunnel, we left the range of the supporting guard towers and the heavy weaponry. I fought harder to keep the fear out of me. We were on our own. I could hear myself breathing as we walked down the corridor. Blood and awful spread over fingernail scratches gouged into the concrete walls. 
The ten of us were responsible for scouring the whole of the interior, plus the prison yard. The prison had held several thousand. How many were left and how many had been infected wasn't known. Security cameras watched us as we moved. Black, dead, electronic eyes connected to nothing and no one now. They had cut the power to kill the incessant alarm noise, so we walked in darkness. The echoing howls grew louder. I switched on the lamp strapped to the side of my head. I swam in a little funnel of red-tinted light, half blind. After what felt like terrified hours, but was probably closer to three minutes, we rounded a corner and came upon a guard post, a little office encased in bulletproof glass. Must be a processing area, I said. The double locked door was ajar. Cuthbert turned the next corner. A hundred voices screamed in the claustrophobic hallway. I double-timed ahead to support Cuthbert and Greg. I could see the rest of the staging area. Guidelines painted on the floor led to a thick, man-proof metal mesh. Pressed against the double-layered wire lath were hundreds of the condemned. Their skin shone red in our artificial light. They shoved their faces forward into the metal squares of the mesh, uncaring that the crush cut into the soft skin around their eyes. They snarled and growled and leaked. Praise be for prison engineers, someone said once we realized that the mass was not about to break through. I took time to study the cancer that had brought us here. Mostly, they were prisoners, thickly muscled and prison hard, but sprinkled here and there were guards, fat, and made fatter by the cumbersome armor they wore. Not that the armor had proved much good for them in the end. They were just so many more condemned now. Just another part of the press. Nothing could help them except the one final thing we were sent here to deliver. I remembered that every last one of them wanted nothing better than to sink their teeth into our throats. I pressed my neck flesh back against the high collar of my Kevlar. Dear God said Agent Susan. We took another moment. Cuthbert said, Cigarette time. Four of us knelt to form a line, recognizing the call for formation. I was on the far left. I don't know if I can watch this, said Agent Kenneth, gulping down air. Fine, you and Agent Susan cover our six. I said, surprised how quick I was to order another agent. With our back protected, the eight of us could concentrate on what was before us. The other four agents formed a standing line behind those who were kneeling. The condemned kept clawing at the barrier, making their din of animal sounds. And so we shall cut out this cancer, intoned Agent Gabriel. We fired. Each of us took time to sight and shoot, each bullet spilling brain, cracking skull. We fired and fired and fired. Our muzzle flashes, even through the suppressors, filled this little corner of the prison with strobing light. I began to sweat, the inside of my protective cocoon growing humid. When it was done, when there was none left standing, I turned to my side and puked until I was empty. I rose, wiping my mouth with the back of my arm. I flipped the switch on my gun back to full auto. No one looked at me. <sighs> Ken, Susan, we're done here. Ken turned, added his stomach contents to mine. One more thing, said Agent Susan. She strode over to the wire cage wall, took out a small bottle of accelerant, and began splashing it through the spaces between the metal onto the bodies. It filled our little room with gasoline smells. She drew a match from a small pouch on her side. With one deft motion, she lit the stick and tossed it. Fire billowed. It filled the hallway with elongated shadows. We might have missed some. They might still be alive under all that, waiting to attack whoever has to clean up this mess. She said, providing an explanation to no one in particular. The meat began to burn as pungent smoke filled the corridor. I was suddenly inappropriately hungry for barbecue. How are we getting through that? Asked Agent Matthew, gesturing forward. There's gotta be a way around it, said Agent Julia. 
I entered the office to our right, discovered a back door to a different corridor. Come on, guys, this way. <laughs> Something huge lunged at me from behind the open door. My head spun toward the noise. I saw the tattered guard's uniform, the meaty deep poured arms reaching out for me. I squeezed my trigger, more untrained reflex than anything worthy. The bullets flew and I remembered an important lesson. Always keep your mouth closed when you shoot something close range. I clamped my mouth tight and kept screaming anyways. Automatic round staggered up the body, surprise ruining my aim. The thing fell. Agent Julia came right next to me to see my kill. You shoot like a heathen, Agent Joseph. She said. I'll, I'll come up with a comeback later. After I clean my pants, I said over quickened breaths. <sighs> Hunger screamed down the hallway around us. Shit! An agent yelled. Incoming! We could fall back into the office, create a choke point. But then how could we proceed into the prison? We might end up closing off our only way through. We needed freedom of movement. Move ahead! We have to hold! I ordered, surprising myself for the second time. Dimly lit things skittered at us from both sides. I sighted. The concrete echoed with the snorting guttural sounds. They were almost upon us. Julia and I hugged the far wall, making room for the others. I bit down into my lip. A flash of a body sprinting flat out came into view. I missed the head, leading my bullets and my headlamp down toward the chest. The thing fell, but I had used too many bullets. I could hear the others firing and yelling at one another behind me. Everything was a deafening, echoing riot of noise. Four more figures with prominent prison tattoos and fingers outstretched like talons ran into the diffuse spotlight coating the far wall. Help! I screamed, voice cracking to be heard over the tumult. I squeezed the trigger as hard as I could. Two fell. The bullets quit coming, and the remaining pair were within three steps of me. Ah! Ah! I released my spent clip, fumbling to try and place a fresh one. Metal scraped, but it wouldn't snap into place. It was no good. They were within a step. They leapt and screamed and salivated. I gripped my gun and tried to use it like a club. My enemies fell. I risked a glance back. Cuthbert and Julia stood, thin trails of smoke wafting from their guns. Thanks. I finished replacing my clip. Always load a fresh clip. That wasn't a habit so much as a reflex now. And hazarded a longer look behind me. Bodies were stacked almost to the ceiling. I heard some slavering creature still climbing to try and get over the mound. Bloodshot eyes lit in the red light of a headlamp appeared over the top of the pile and Agent Greg fired again, ending the climber. I estimated maybe 50 kills, enough so that yet another path was closed to us. Susan walked over to the stack, spreading the accelerant once again and birthing another fire. I guess we'll go this way. Further and further I traveled through the twisting prison corridors. We fought on, but not with the same intensity as before. I kept biting down on the pink of my mouth to keep from sicking up. There were horrible things in the prison. We came to a series of cells, Block D according to the placard naming the place. Our lights barely reached the ceiling three stories above us. Each floor had hundreds of cells. Each cell had a clear, bulletproof plexiglass door to reveal what it had inside. Half the doors were open. We were going to have to clear out each and every room. This is the special needs section, I think. They keep all the child molesters, rapists, and gang dropouts here. Anybody who would be killed in the general population. Agent Greg said. Hey. Said Cuthbert. What? I asked. How we doing on ammo? Shouldn't we be conserving? I scowled. He was right, of course. I had already spent half of my allotted clips, hosing with automatic fire early on. I'd evolved through three-round bursts to single shot as I calmed. My aim improved as conditioning kicked in. I did a quick check. The others weren't much better. None of us wanted to go back to the quarantine ring and bag more ammo. Especially since they might not give it. Just tell us, Figure it out. 
One of Jones's favorite lines. Knives? Julia asked, reaching for her blade. She began to pull the large, gaudy thing, some kind of survival knife. I shook my head. We can't bleed them out, not quick anyway. Have to pierce or crush the brain, and too much of a chance to get the pig sticker stuck. Agent Matthew reached for something on his back. He pulled an eight-inch black cylinder. With a practiced flick of the wrist, the collapsible baton unfurled with a clack. I slung my rifle around behind me, drew my baton. Something lay on the ground of the first cell, breathing slowly. We took our positions, ready to beat the brains out of whatever came next. We opened the door. Halfway through the second floor, we found a survivor. It was some little guy with a tear by his left eye and other markings of his tribe. He squinted, trying to see us. All he could make out were nebulous shapes obscured by the bright red lights. Who who are you guys? What the fuck is going on? He asked. Cuthbert pulled him to his feet, began inspecting him. What happened here? Asked Agent Susan. At the sound of a woman's voice, his prison hardness melted away somewhat. He seemed genuinely happy to see us, though... He would probably be happy to see anyone not intent on chewing his brains. Uh, I don't know. way I heard it, though, it started with a dirty needle. I mean, all needles in prison is dirty, you know what I'm saying? But this was serious dirty. Anyway, there started being bites. Bear from my crew got bit, got sick. They killed him in the infirmary after he bit the doctors and one of the pigs. More people got bit. There was a pig riot in the yard. A lot of teeth, a lot of stabbing, a lot of blood. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how many's left. He said, adding, You gotta get me out of here. What's this? Asked Cuthbert, pulling up the man's stained, dank shirt to reveal small teeth marks on his lower back. I got that like a week ago, before any of this shit. Julia glanced to me for some reason. Can't take that chance. Cuthbert swung his collapsible baton, snapping the metal across the prisoner's face. More blows followed. The inmate screamed between the impacts. Red and pink and white leaked out between the crunches. He stopped moving. We walked on. Clearing the prison moved from terrifying to tedious. We walked on, following circuitous hallways to the cell blocks, checking each and every room and each and every floor. At times we spent a few more shells, but we relied on melee now. My arm began to tire. We burnt bodies as we went. By the time we cleared cell block D, my bicep was throbbing. One down, three more to go. Plus the yard. We grew silent, marched on. In block C, we inspected more survivors, maybe a dozen or so in total. As per our instructions, we left those in their cells, made sure to lock the doors behind us. Nobody felt like getting a shiv in the back. I was on point when we discovered the barricades. These were jury-rigged and precarious, cobbled together out of whatever happened to be laying around, which meant they were largely comprised of bodies. I absently began to count the corpses. Bright, white illumination from industrial-grade flashlights blinded me. A mag light, the kind that cops favor because they double as nightsticks in a pinch. I made the gesture for stop to my squad and said, Hello? I raised my hand, palm out, in the universal sign of humanity. Could you kill the light? You're blinding us. We'll light the hallway. I flipped my headlamp up, made everything look rosy. Their mag light went out, and the shiny helmeted face retracted. A minute later, more of the helmets reappeared. They hovered there, above the obstacle built of laundry carts and dead men. A hand lifted one of the masks to reveal the acne-scarred face of a heavy-set twenty-something. Are we glad to see you? We let them talk, get their story out. Rescued now by the cavalry, they had noticeably let their attention falter. I pitied them, and wondered if I had ever been stupid enough to put so much faith in assumed authority. All we were was a bunch of men in black Kevlar armor deliberately modeled to look official and safe by modern standards. I even had a badge that didn't say much of anything, just imitated what you might see on TV. It always worked. The surviving guards weren't telling us anything we didn't know. But it is always good to let victims talk. 
to make sense of what just happened to them. We could ask our questions and begin moving on when they were done, taking a breather as the guards jabbered. In time, they began to reach the end of what they needed to say. Then just ran through the prison like wildfire, man. It was just this morning that we were hearing about the crazies in the medical bay before everything just went to shit. I don't know how many guards are left, but we hold up here with another eight. They left, though. They went out to try to clear a way out. I, I don't know where they are or if they made it. You should come with us, said Cuthbert. Yeah, yeah. So how many more of there are you? Just us. But there are more outside waiting for us to finish up. You would think prison officers would be better equipped to deal with an outbreak of zombieism. Even in the best of times, they have to worry about the reign of hepatitis lace shit. They know how to fight. They know how to not get bit and how important it is to protect the skin. But they don't carry guns. In fact, all their weapons tend to be less than lethal. Hence, their thinking tended to be less than lethal. Hence, they were largely useless to us. We were the only reason any of them were going to make it out alive. And we couldn't make any promises. All they wanted was to leave, to flee out the path we had carved through the infected. But we had a job to do. Burn the cancer from this place. That was the most important thing, even more important than their lives. But we need to get out of here! One of the guards screamed. We're not leaving till the job is done. We could use the extra hands, and your odds are a lot better with us than by yourselves. You guys can stay here or come with us. Your call. Either way, we're moving on in two minutes. The guards conferred, pulling up their black plastic face shields to whisper at one another. We sipped from lukewarm water through plastic straws connected to our water pouches. We'll come with you. Good. Cuthbert nodded. The guard's voice was impassive, but I could see the signs of fear in the tilt of the man's shoulders. We would put them in front. Riot shields would be useful there, and they wouldn't be able to run. We confiscated their flashlights, told them we would light the way. It was a testament to their trauma that they didn't argue. We didn't find anything in B-Block except blood and bodies. The fighting resumed in one of the halls between A and B-Block. We killed some loners. The wonderful thing about fighting zombies is that they don't protect their heads. They just reach for you, the same way every zombie reaches for you. All you have to do is roll out of their reaching, clutching hands and get one good swack in. They fall and you keep beating them until they stop moving. Child could do it. Hell, children have done it. It's easy. Until you meet a lot of the bastards. Or lose your cool. The prison team trudged ahead of us. I could see them quaking below the armor they didn't believe in. They were spoiled, used to overwhelming their enemies used to their CS and pepper gas and all their tricks doing their work for them. All of that bullshit had no place here, now. We either killed our enemies or died in the process. Still, their armor was suited to the task at hand. They could just learn how important believing was. My thoughts were interrupted by howls. Footfalls approached. Ready! Screamed one of the guards. Our reluctant conscripts pushed ahead, plastic shields angled and wooden clubs at the ready. Condemned appeared, red, hungry eyes and slack, drooling mouths. I wanted to pull my gun. There were many, but I followed the lead of my squad. We did have to conserve ammo, after all. The zombies moved quickly. This was all getting predictable. Within minutes, frenzied meat and bone met riot shields. We pushed back, reinforcing our makeshift shield wall against the mad strength of men divorced of reserve or reason. We pushed and battered, but still they came. Our feet slid across smooth concrete. A grasping hand came within inches of my eyes. Guns! I screamed, deciding this baton bullshit wasn't going to cut it this time. I pushed down on the shoulders of the two guards in front of me, forcing them to kneel. Kenneth followed my example, bringing down the other guard. The riot shields out of the way. Our eight fellow agents opened up with their already drawn assault rifles. The zombies seemed almost confused as they pushed themselves over the angled shields, only to be ripped apart by the point-blank rounds of our chemo-issued automatic weaponry. I think I was screaming through this. It's hard to tell. I know I was screaming when some expended brass, the bullet casing that had recently held the metal in powder, flipped up and over a barrel into the nape of my neck. 
My neck singed, and I turned and jerked and tried to claw the burning bit away from me. The guard in front of me didn't know what I was doing, but his panic, panic that we had barely managed to hold at bay, broke open like a rotten egg. Like I said, the guards had been spoiled. They didn't believe, not in their armor, not in their comrades, not in their weapons. And as the book says, what are men without belief? Dead. The man dropped his shield. Even though I couldn't see them, I knew that his eyes were fevered and terrified behind his black face shield. This was the worst decision I had ever seen a human being make. His shield fell on me. The infected pushed corpses forward. The dead began to spill over our line. The guard, standing tall to run, took round after round, but his armor kept me from being fatal. He clawed where the bullets had embedded themselves. The smell, the oh-so-near taste of blood drove the condemned forward. I could feel the frenzied impacts as body sprinted over the shield I tried to push up. No good, the weight kept increasing as more and more pounded over me. The forward corpses and the armored guard soaked up bullets and the cancer made headway, stomping over me in numbers that made it hard for me to breathe. I could only see what was happening above me, through the semi-translucent plexiglass. More and more blood spattered over me, obscuring my vision. I saw as the condemned pulled back the guard who had abandoned his place. I could see greedy claws shoved into his wounds, talons pulling. Even over the cacophony, I could hear the ripping. Matthew emptied his clip. Before he could replace it, one of the condemned had reached out and gripped him by the back of the head. I watched as the thing sunk teeth into his soft cheek just below the eye. Susan lowered her rifle to help Matthew fight off the former prisoner. That was the last thing I saw before another splash of blood turned my last scrap of window red. I was pinned beneath the body-length shield, overlooked for now. My rifle, slung from my shoulder, was shoved into my nodding, cramping back. The screaming sounds got louder, and the bullet sounds stopped. All I could do was wait till the condemned discovered a meal beneath the plastic. All I could do was wait to die. That was a fucking TV dinner. When you don't die, eventually you have to try to move. The hallway had been quiet for 15 minutes. I was still crushed and pinned, so I began to wiggle the shield that trapped me. I was convinced that this motion would finally draw the attention of the cancer. So after a brief fit of wiggling, I once again stilled myself and waited for death. More time passed, and I was again forced to accept that my death was not imminent. It was almost annoying. I pushed, but this time I managed to lever the plastic up enough for me to press with my legs. I grunted and kicked off. Still warm cadavers slid and flopped away. I was free. I scrambled for my gun, drawing it as quickly as possible. I couldn't see a damn thing. I held as still as I could, listening. All I could hear was my own frantic breathing. Tooth and nail and gun and blade, I've come. I whispered into the dark, trying my hardest to make believe that I was a chemo agent badass instead of a scared, shitless recruit. Conditioning kicked in and my noisy breathing receded. With reluctant fingers, I felt around in the blackness, convinced at any time some teeth would bite through the thin material of my gloves. I stopped, listened. I heard a small sliding sound that I couldn't locate and the soft percussion of rain outside the building. I moved again, fumbling. My breathing increased and I stilled myself. I repeated that cycle a few times as I mucked about in the hungry, moist blackness for another 15 minutes. Then I had it. I could feel the texture of composite reinforced man shell. I had found a dead agent. I ran my hands, awkward as a high school boy's after prom, over the body of my squad mate. I snatched when I felt the sturdy metal tube of one of the guard's confiscated flashlights. 
I massaged the rubber nub, blinding myself in a new way. As my eyes adjusted to the sudden light, I saw a crawling mass scrambling over the dead towards me. I jumped back out of reach. The condemned had a broken spine, and it had been silenced by three holes through its throat. Despite its injuries, it was still dragging itself closer, sliding soundless and reaching with every pull of its hands. Its mouth yawned wide, dribbling. I didn't wait another moment. Its skull crunched in time with a maglite blow. It kept swinging until it stopped moving. Everyone was gone. Through some miracle, I wasn't bitten. Now I would have to complete the mission myself. It amazed me that I could still care about eliminating the cancer after losing everyone. Chemo conditioning wedded to the desires for revenge seemed to be a powerful combination. I took stock. My headlamp had been crushed when I was pinned. I reached and plucked a shard of plastic from the skin behind my ear. I prayed my blood hadn't mingled with anything infected. There were four bodies I cared about. The guard, Agent Susan, Agent Greg, and Agent Matthew were all dead. I found them in various stages of being torn apart. But even the best of them was bad enough off that I didn't bother confirming a pulse. I spit on the guard's corpse. I did what I was conditioned to do. I compartmentalized all the fear and shame and rage for release later. I went to work. I scavenged what I could from the bodies. Clips, accelerant, two spare handguns. Unfortunately, all the headlamps were broken or missing. I would have to rely on the scavenged mag. I began to attach the black metal torch to my rifle barrel. Praise be for duct tape. I wandered, backtracking the way we had come to try and find any retreated survivors. All I discovered was more still ones. I found Agent Jacob and took a minute to pay my respects and grab his extra clips. That left five unaccounted for. I let some small hope grow in me that they were still alive. I walked, moving slowly now. I had to be conscious of each and every footfall. I didn't have a squad to back me. All I found was the dead. I personally walked each floor of A block, personally checked every single cell door. Nothing but blood stink. Nothing but the flayed bodies. Nothing but what was left of the prisoners. It was starting to get to me. I knew something bad was going to happen. And the longer the delay, the worse I convinced myself it would eventually be. I walked further down the hall that led from A block to D block. I turned a corner, found myself squinting into the red light of a headlamp. Joseph! Julia cried out. I lowered my weapon and let the relief show on my face. We had a quick conference. Susan, Matthew, Greg, and Jacob were all dead. That I knew. But they had also lost Thomas. That left me, Cuthbert, Julia, Kenneth, and Gabriel. Plus the two guards. How did you survive? Where were you? Asked Cuthbert. Well, after the other guard lost his shit and dropped his shit. Hey, don't you dare talk about Officer Rodriguez like that, you asshole! Said one of the guards, pressing his face into mine. I was in no mood. I would have kneed him in the crotch, but figured he had a cup on. I brought the butt of my rifle to the side of his helmet, <clears throat> gaining a satisfying crack for my efforts. The guard went down to all fours. The rest of my squad pulled their guns on the other guard who held up his hands. Agent Julia said, We appreciate all that you have done, and would greatly appreciate if you could remain calm. She spoke in a sweet, calm tone that reminded me of a computer-generated voice. I don't want any trouble, the standing guard replied. The other guard groaned. I looked down. I wanted to say something conciliatory, but I was just too tired. Too 
bloody tired to think of calming words. As I was saying, uh, after the shield dropped, I was pinned under the crush of bodies. It was pretty well covered in blood, so I guess the condemned just overlooked me. It took me a while to get out. I'm just glad to be back with you. The guards backed away into darkness. We let them go. We're glad to see you, but we have a problem. Finished Cuthbert. He took me down a small hallway, over to a barred window. We stayed in a low crouch. Cuthbert flipped off his headlamp. He shushed me without making a sound. I raised my head to peer through the glass. We had found the yard. We had found more condemned than we had bullets for. There were hundreds. A milling, swirling, swaying mass of infected making low noises like cattle as rain continued to fall. I have no idea how we're going to clear the yard, I said, crawling back to our little huddle. I do, said Cuthbert. But there's really something I should show you guys. And with that, he leaned his head right, exposing a shallow red wound where bloody fingernails had glanced across into his neck. Cuthbert talked. We listened. I didn't say anything because I didn't know what to do. But Joan said there's no cure. My hands have already begun to shake. It won't be long before I'm just another one. I lowered my eyes. So here's my plan. We're going to get all the zombies to one side of the yard and pray the chain link fence is enough to keep them back. Then I'll backtrack. There's another entrance to the yard between B and C. While all their eyes are on you, I'll enter the yard wired up with all our accelerant. When the zombies close in, I'll firebomb them. Cuthbert, I said. Julia shot a look at me. I don't like it, but it's solid. Or at least as solid as anything we're going to think of. The only thing I have to add is that I'm personally going to shoot you in the head so they don't get you. Cuthbert's face split with a gallows grin. I'd expect nothing less. Ten minutes later, Julia and I banged on a small window Cuthbert had shown me earlier. We made as much noise as we could. At least a thousand eyes turned toward us, and I swear I felt the ground shaking as they ran in unison. I don't think all of them had even heard us, just been drawn by the moans and attention of the herd. Cuthbert should already be in position. We had wired him up, given him plenty of time to make his way around to Block C. But nothing happened. The hungry fuckers kept coming for us. The howling dark faces pressed in their swarms to the chain link. Waves of condemned came, clambering and stampeding over their kin to get ever higher. Fuck, I said. I hope they can't ramp over the fence. The heap of them grew ever larger, and the fence began to buckle and flex under the weight of men. I grabbed my gun, readied myself to run. The window we were screaming and banging behind wouldn't hold. We would have to flee and establish a killing field. The monsters turned. It was a relief to see so much hunger and hate turn away from us. Except we knew what they were turning toward. The plan was for Cuthbert to get as deep in the zombies as possible before ignition. After that, we would grant him the gift of sleep. That was impossible now. He was a tiny spar, lost in a rolling sea of infected. We couldn't even see him. Just knew he was there by the way the waves surged toward something new to rend. I think he knew it would end this way. Get me up! Lift me up so I can shoot him! Screamed Julia, struggling with the bolt-locked doors. I put a hand on her shoulder, shook my head. We heard a pop. Within seconds, great roaring gushes of flame poured up and out, heat and force enough to push back the ocean of dumb meat. The condemned kept coming, though, kept pushing forward, burning, dying, being taken apart by the fire or the force of the final pops. The last few bottles of accelerant burst, spraying fire and death across our enemies. Smoke and steam rose like incense to an evil deity. What remained pushed forward anyway, senseless as ever in their sprint for uninfected meat. I prayed Cuthbert had a quick death.
We spent half an hour to pick off the damaged survivors of the yard bombing and another hour to finish our final sweep for stragglers. We had fought and won. Silence reigned as we marched out beyond the miniguns, beaten and done. The cleaning squad trotted past, their flamethrowers already lit. My shoulders hunched as I walked into the trailer, through the plastic valves of detox to the chemical showers. I turned on the spray of water and non-toxic bleach analogs, felt the burning of cleansing required by chemo writ. Even as I clamped my eyelids and mouth shut, I shuddered, thinking of the neutral conference room two trailers over and the debrief that awaited me. I cried to myself that the shower washed away the gore and stink of my first night as a full-fledged agent of chemo. Author's Note Hey, all you people out there in internet land. This is author J.M. Perkins. I hope you enjoyed this second Doonstief installment of Chemo. The Condemned combines my love of monsters, violence, and cults. I was really happy to write protagonists that act as though they have actually found time to rent a zombie movie. This episode is the opening chapter of my Chemo novel. You can write me an email or visit my website to learn more. Additionally, if you like this story, you can listen to the further adventures of Agent Joseph via Doonstief's production or 19 Nocturne Boulevard's adaptation of Chemo, the town of Golden Woods. Much thanks to Rish and Big for all their advice, encouragement, and hard work. You guys are the best. All right, welcome back, folks. Thank you for returning. So, right out of the gate, zombies. Or, in this case, the condemned. Yes. Uh, this is the first story we've done with zombies, or infected in this way and uh very very popular monster right now as far as books go movies go podcasts go Mm -hmm. norm sherman has an excellent zombie teen (laughs) angst song there's uh, the jonathan colton song about the zombies Uh, they're just they're on top of the world i think they're they're trying to get vampires to, to fall off the hill so they can be king of the monster hill right now i like zombies a lot um, these aren't traditional zombies that we have here, though, right? No, and well, they do call them zombies in the story, but but that's not the technical term for them. Traditionally, a zombie has been a reanimated dead person. Uh huh. You know, usually through voodoo, but you know, after George Romero, through some kind of almost supernatural contagion. And and you know, I don't know whether the first time we saw this type of a condemned type zombie was in 28 days later or if there was something before that but i always think of 28 days later when it's a contagion type zombie uh-huh that's the same kind of thing they have in the resident evil too right Isn't, aren't they basically zombies that have been made that way because of some sort of by contagion? some chemical that that i don't know exactly on that if those people are dead and came back or if they're just people that are very sick mhm They need a a vaccine, and then they'll be happy and normal again. Oh, well, if so, then definitely, yeah. Well, I don't know. I I haven't watched those movies. Like I said in our Two Truths and a Lie, I've seen one zombie movie ever. Did you tell the audience what that zombie movie was? I didn't. What was it? Do you you think by now we've proclaimed a winner? Okay. But the, the one movie that I have seen was Shaun of the Dead. It's the only zombie movie I've ever seen. That makes me a bad person. No, what do you do to the homeless makes you a bad person. Just oh. the, 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 the zombie makes you an unexperienced person. Inexperienced. I mean, the, the, the lack of zombie films make you a, a less well-rounded film goer. That's pretty much the worst that can be said about you. Oh. But I'm very fond of zombies. Right now, since it's October, AMC is producing a television series, a zombie TV series called The Walking Dead. Oh, yes. I have read. See, there's that. I may have only seen one zombie movie, but I've read probably six or so. How many trade paperbacks have they gotten to with that series? Nine. I've probably read eight of those nine, then, of the, The Walking Dead. And that is just a great comic book. And yeah, we don't know... Right now, whether the TV show is as good, but it certainly got some talent attached to it, and uh, 
hopefully it's great and uh, we can look forward to many, many seasons. The, the idea that Kirkman had for the comic book was a zombie movie that never ends. Uh-huh. Anyhow, uh, enough about zombies. Uh, I think somebody technically could say these aren't zombies at all. Why are you even referring to them as that? And, and I'm, I'm sorry. It's just if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck. It's probably a, a rooster, right? No. I thought that this was a very interesting story. Now, I came to it from a different perspective than you did because you read an earlier version of the story. And then, I, uh-huh. and I think you gave – can I call him John? Is that okay? I think that's fine. Okay, and you gave John some notes. And then I read a later version, quite liked it. And well, you, I, you had some suggestions for John too, which then uh, were incorporated as well. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I don't believe that. There was a whole scene that we cut out off the end of the, the story, if you recall. Oh, that's true. I think that will a- appear in the collected chemo anthology when that hits stores in I don't know when. But uh, yeah, I, th- I think that that scene as a standalone story was unnecessary. And, and so we, we removed that scene. So yeah, there's that too. From a podcasting perspective... We tried to put together the same voice actors in the same parts. There was Joseph, which was played by me again. And then there was Julia, which uh, Nicole is back again doing that role. I think those are the only returning characters of those two. Oh, oh and, okay. and, and, and the, the sergeant guy, Jones, I think may have been his name. Mm-hmm. That was you again. Well, that, to me, it's really interesting because this is Joseph's first... Adventure. This is his uh, initiation, if you will, into the the chemo organization. And there is a the, the, the you just referred to. There was a scene after the shower where he is debriefed. Basically, the interviewer asks him, "What have we learned?" But Joseph doesn't really know how to answer that. It's been a really awful experience, and that's where the story originally ended. But we know from having read Town of Golden Woods that Joseph goes on to have many adventures in, in, in chemo. And I spoke to John, the, the writer, about what other adventures were out there. And, and yeah, they all seem to be supernatural related, much like this, just, you know, chemo gets sent out on a mission to investigate something, and it turns out to be some ominous force, some kind of uh-huh. dangerous thing that requires lots of shooting. I wouldn't be surprised if... We do another chemo story sometime out there. I, I enjoy them. I like the world that he's made. It, it seems very well developed, but at the same time, w- we don't know enough about it to predict what's going to happen or who is this or the hierarchy or, or what is going on there. But I, I get the feeling that, that John knows a lot more about what's going on and who the characters are and who they serve and why and this book of chemo mm-hmm. that they're always quoting from and what the training <laughs> is like and, and all that stuff. So just like... In the first story, the berserk aspect, you know, was something I'd never heard about. You know, we get we get new stuff in each story, I, I would imagine. Right. And uh, did you want to say something about it, or can I just keep talking? You can keep talking. Another thing that's really interesting, if you liked this story, is that the friend of the show, Julie Hoverson, did an audio drama version, adaptation, if you will, of Chemo, the Town of Golden Woods, the first one that we did. And that's over on her podcast, 19 Nocturne Boulevard. She took the text that John sent us that we read on the show, and then she adapted it for old timey radio. <laughs> and she introduced a couple new and characters. She played it off her Victrola and recorded it back into her computer and gave it that old timey feel. I'd like to give her an old timey feel. <laughs> How could you have ever been nominated for a Parsec? Sorry. <clears throat> Oh, oh, sorry. So she asked us to reprise our roles of Burke and Joseph, and she got a whole big cast to do the rest and, and sound effects. And to me, it was a totally different experience. It was as if you had read a book and then you went and saw the movie version of that book. Only, only, only this movie didn't have pictures. Well, yeah, but, but that's not what I'm getting at. It's <laughs> I, OK, as if you performed a play and then they made a movie of that play. And you got to play the same part, but the script was different and there were changes here and there. And it's a completely different experience watching that play versus watching a movie. Okay. Did you not find it to be that way? I, did you listen to uh I did, yeah. The I found it to be a very uh, interesting thing as well. It was a strange experience because 
It's like the person who's made the film and then somebody does a remake of it years down the line or whatever when everything old is new again. It was kind of like that. It was it was really interesting to, to be able to see something that we did and we put together already before and now see it sort of remixed in a new fashion. In this case, this one had no narrator. It was just, you know, we're hearing the sounds of the things going on. And I thought it was really well done. I had, I'll, I'll admit that when she sent me the script, and maybe it's just because I don't do radio drama much, so I don't understand it as well. She sent me the script, and I couldn't really see how it was going to come out in my head just by reading the script. But, you know, I said my lines and sent them to her, and she, of course, knew all along how it was going to come out and how it would work and had this overarching plan all along, and it came out really well. When I finally listened to it, when it was done, then I was like, oh, okay, I can see how this works, and, and it worked really I liked it a lot. Yeah, I think that there are probably people out there that like audio drama, but don't necessarily like audio books. Uh -huh. And then they're the opposite. And so there's something for everybody in, as far as Kimo, a town of Golden there Woods go, goes. Yeah. And who knows, next year, she may think, oh, it would be really cool to do The Condemned. You never know. But the, another thing that I wanted to mention was that we had our good friend Brian Lincoln edit this for us. That's right. Now, not just edit, I'm sorry. He produced this episode. And basically what that entails is he has the text in front of him. He assigns parts. He makes sure that they all get recorded. He edits it together. He puts in music. He puts in sound effects. Uh, just everything that you heard before the author's note uh, was Brian. That's right. Gosh, that's a lot of work. But it's always really, really fascinating what results because it's something different than I do, something different than you do. And Brian did this crazy thing on this where he he has his own podcast. It's called uh, Full Cast Podcast. And he, like a documentary true <laughs> making of featurette for a, you know, a movie, he documented the making of Chemo, The Condemned, on his podcast. And you can find that at www.fullcastpodcast.com. And to me... That's another really fun, interesting twist or angle, just like what Julie did with the last chemo story, is, is how he approached everything. He just went step by step through the process of how he did the sound effects of the zombies. And, and uh, this is really, really cool. And maybe it will help people appreciate how much work goes into these things. Which is probably not the best thing to say. How much work and how much creativity and art goes into it. You know, it's not just work, but there's a lot of fun to it. And, you know, when you create something like that, it can be really cool. I was talking about that last time, you know, when I, we did uh, Open 24 Hours a few weeks ago. In that, I wasn't the main editor of the story. Rish actually tried his hand at it uh, again, and he cut all of our reading down to, you know, just the actual text. And then he also went through and he changed the voices of the characters around so that Anne One sounded like a robot and the rats had a higher pitched voice, etc., etc. You did all of that stuff, and then you sent it to me just for the sound effects and the music part of the, uh, the story. And so I went through and I was doing that, and... I hadn't been invested in it yet. I hadn't spent all the time on it that you had spent on it. And I was just thinking, okay, this is a fairly standard story. I'll just kind of get the sound effects in there as quick as I can, get this out there, and started working on it. And uh, pretty quickly in there, I get to the Coleman Lantern attack scene where they're throwing Coleman Lanterns, and then Anne One starts shooting back with her lasers and... And all of a sudden, the creative juices, I guess, I don't know, they start flowing. And, uh, yeah, I'm, oh, and, and I'll put this one, layer that on top of this sound, and then this, that'll make a really good laser kind of fire sound, and then we'll get this, and we'll have some explosions going off from where it's hitting, and we'll make some, like, clunky kind of metal sounds going around, like the lanterns hitting the ground. And you can hear the whoosh when they throw the lanterns, and... I got so involved into that scene and I was just like, oh, shoot, there goes me doing it quick and, and getting it out there and ready. 
there's definitely a lot of uh, a joy and, and and fun that comes from doing something like that. The creativity and the uh, art and the expression is is as much a part of it as the work is. And I think that's probably the way it is with most artistic creations. If you write a story, sure it's work, but it's fun. If you're an artist and you're painting or you're drawing or whatever, sure it's work. You got to sit there and spend the time, but it's fun. You're you're driven by your creative expression that you have to uh, get out so there's that too i don't know if i've pumped it up enough yet though do you think it's possible (laughs) i i i appreciate you trying the reason uh we were mentioning this was twofold one is to thank brian yeah for all the hard work thank you so much it really makes our lives uh, wonderful and yeah he really did not did does go above and beyond to help us make this podcast what it is. Now, I don't know if you like us, if you're listening to us just to hate, that's fine. (laughs) But if you like us, the fact that you're hearing this episode at all is is a lot to do with Brian. I I, I mentioned Nicole and how she pulled our fat out of the fire with being our submissions editor. And, And Brian tries to take a story every as often as he can. Yeah, as soon as he's done with one... I'm sure by the time that this episode is airing, he will already be uh, in search of the next story and be ready to uh, get that going. You complain a lot that you don't have time to write. You don't have time to beat your kids. You've always (laughs) got to be at work. You've always got these responsibilities. And then I'm here snapping my fingers saying, hey, where's the fucking podcast? (laughs) And you just have all this stuff on your plate. And it's, it's taking away from the other things that you'd need to do. And then Brian swoops in. And he offers to produce an episode. So, you know, it gives us all the more time to work on the episodes that you are working on. And then we at one time wanted to be weekly. Is it fair to say that we are the fortnightly audio fiction podcast? You might be able to say that. We have a tendency to be a podcast on, then the next week another podcast, and then three weeks or so and for the next one it's it's well, sadly it's, very inconsistent it is but you know it's partly because life intercedes to make things difficult to make us miss our deadline to make us not be able to get together your wife's car is in the shop today uh, we had to go get her f- from work yeah we had to go pick her up from work in the middle of recording an episode we're just like okay pause here let's go and then we'll finish when we get back and i know you're tired these are all things that contribute to making it difficult to get the podcast out and that leads me into the second reason i mentioned all this we need people who think that that sounds fun doing what brian did to produce episodes for us, to help us with the production. Now, obviously, we always need people to do voices, people to do episode art, people to submit stories. I mean, that's the first thing that we need. But it would really help us if there's somebody out there that has a passion for editing, for artistic expression expression in that way, saying, hey, you know, I'd like to read a story and have some voices and edit them together and, and use free sounds and free music or make it myself and and produce something like that. If that sounds like something you'd like to do, yeah, I can't stress enough how much we would appreciate that, how much we would need that kind of help you talk. Yeah, if you'd like to volunteer for that, just drop us a line. Drop us an email at uh, editor at doonsteef.com. We'd really like to, and it's something we've been wanting to do pretty much since the show started, We've been calling out for volunteers, and what we'd really like to do is just get a team assembled. You know, we have me and Rish around, but now we've got Brian who's willing to produce a story. I wouldn't be surprised if we'd do one a month if we asked him to. And, you know, that's what we'd really like to have is a a team of folks that could help us produce stories so that we could get to the point where we really are a a weekly show. It's not going to be possible if it's up to me. I'm flagging. I'm I'm like, I'm like that runner that's at the end of the marathon, and he's just like, "Oh my gosh, I'll never make it." And everybody's just like, "Come on, just just you know, 500 more feet." And I'm weaving back and forth in the road, just trying to remain upright. That's the state I find myself in. So any help we could get would definitely be greatly appreciated. Brian, I know he started way back uh, like a year ago almost doing episodes for us and his episode is better every time it comes out and I'm sure that he's learning each one that he does. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, checking out that podcast. Yeah, I'll do that as soon as I as we hang up. 
We have to do it. Oh, hey, Rish. Guess what time it is? Time to beg for donations. No, actually, no, it's not. Oh, okay. Well, then what time? Time, is it? time for something you like even more. Announcer man? It's time for the hate letter of the week. Oh, what? Dude, that was like years ago we did that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the deal is, but it's back. No. Wait, we, you're telling me we got a hate letter? That's right. A hate letter arrived in our mailbox, and it's time to read it this week. You thought it was safe to go back in the water. <laughs> uh, here it is. It says, Hi, Big and Rish. I had to take a long road trip on sad family business, and I decided to listen to all the Doonstief episodes. I thought it would raise my spirits. So, starting in Richmond, Virginia, I began at the beginning and listened to one episode after another. Contrary to expectations, I was not driven to homicidal road rage or the urge to smear feces on the walls of rest stops or murder hookers at truck stops along I-95. But this sounds like a love letter. A little. The stories are good, as are the productions, female voices and accents notwithstanding, and I even enjoyed the banter after the episodes. However, oh, however. somewhere on I-75 south of Tampa, my spirit was crushed. When you discussed cats, I realize that you two are actually the worst kind of sociopaths, the kind that can walk among normal people without exposing your inner black souls. Your complete misrepresentation of feline nature revealed your evil plan to try to make dogs supreme and your pathetic need to have an animal companion that fawns and slobbers over your slightest sign of affection. Dog people are obviously insecure because they wither under the cool, appraising stare of a cat. People who favor cats are clearly superior as we prefer to earn the respect of our feline friends. I continue to listen, hoping for something redeeming to emerge about your character. But thus far, spring 2009 issue, I remain disappointed. Best, Max. Thank you, Max, for uh, sending us the first hate letter that we've read on the show in a long time. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've just got two words for you. Like cats and dogs. That's not two words. <laughs> well, we've mentioned it before, but uh, we can always mention it again. Uh, I'm not a cat person. And uh, we also have a secondary podcast where we are allowed to vent our frustrations. And uh, maybe it's time for us to bring up cats once again. <laughs> Something we'll have to uh, look into. Because, you know, we haven't gotten enough hate mail recently. I mean, this is just one. No, no, I don't want any more. <laughs> uh, clearly, you read this one because it was well formatted. Yes. Block memo style. So, good job with that. Well, it's similar to our uh, rejection form letter, where we, we thank them, <laughs> we try and say something positive, and then, no, here you go. <laughs> Maybe. Keep those cards and letters coming. For no, yeah. wait. I haven't yeah. said that in a long time, either. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. No, no, I'm saying we're not saying that. This was just an accidental return of something <laughs> old. Uh, coming up next, what exactly does Doonstief mean? <laughs> Gosh, we haven't done that in a while either, have we? Wasn't he the other giant Autobot besides Omega Supreme? <laughs> I think so. No, wait, he was the Decepticon. Oh, he uh, was the version yeah. of Omega Supreme. If you're ever in a generous mood, we'd love it if you donated. Back on topic, guys. This chemo universe is really cool. I hope that uh, JM sends us more stories. And I also hope that we're around long enough to continue doing this. Uh, I mentioned the very first time we ever had a sequel. I was like, wouldn't it be cool if we had series going on our, our show? You know, and it's like, okay, here's episode three of this. And yeah, I don't think we ever got a third installment of anything, did we? I don't think we have yet. We've had a couple of Clob stories. We've had a couple of Ernie Pine stories. Ah, uh, Reluctant Ghost Hunter Ernie Pine. We've had a couple of chemo stories, but yeah, I don't know if we have had a third chapter. You know, just the other day I listened to 
gosh, it must. I think it's like the eleventh Union dues story that they've Over done escape on Escape Pod, and and those were definitely one of those things that just hooked me right in and made me thinking, oh yeah, oh, and when a new one would come up, I'd be like yes, and I'd be in there listening to it right away. And so you know, if we can get something like that, that that'll bring them back. It's great. But we recently spoke to an author, a fairly well-known author, about doing a story of his. And uh, we accepted it. And it's like, oh, yeah, we're, we'll be happy to record it. And then he said, and here's the sequel. Yeah. Go ahead. Go go to town on that, too. And so that's something to promise you uh, in the, the upcoming weeks that I'm excited about. Because that first story was great. And I can't imagine the second one won't be. The Continuing Adventures. I hope we get some continuing adventures of Agent Joseph. Get to find out how he takes on the coven of vampires and the undead super robot monkey team. So I, I guess we'll we'll bring this show to a close. But I do want to remind you that we've got that October Scary Story event going right now. Write a scary story. Send it to us by the 2nd of November at submissions at dunesteef.com. Is that correct? That's right. And uh, yeah, you've got a few more uh, a, a little while left still to write that. If you uh, if you get on it, you will succeed. These uh these military stories are really interesting. I just I I've never really been a part of the military except for playing military parts as an extra in LA for this movie The Good German that Steven Soderbergh did. He made us do this boot camp for extras where we learned how to march, we learned how to put on the uniform, we learned how to load our gun and how to hold it and carry it, point it, and, you know, stuff that seems silly for people that aren't even seen on the screen. But, <laughs> you know, somebody has to have a job and military consultant kind of thing. But I also, I, I got to work with the Marines, the actual U.S. Marines, right before I moved away from L.A. And uh, the idea of going into a situation, an unknown situation, where there may or may not be, but probably may, be people that want to kill you. That's really scary, even if they aren't undead, undead or bitten by rage-infested monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what your military experience has been. I was in the Boy Scouts. That's oh, kind of a pseudo-military organization. We had ranks and uniforms, and we did flag ceremonies at the start of meetings, but... My family is kind of a military family. My dad worked with the National Guard full time for years and also did, you know, the weekend stuff and was part of a unit and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of my brothers have also done the same thing. I'm just the one peace Nick, I guess, of the family or the no good Nick. Maybe that's the Nick I am. I didn't feel the call to that for some reason. And I think it's just because I don't want to go and have some drill sergeant and be like, Get down! What are you doing? And the froth coming out of his mouth and he's yelling swear words that haven't even been around long enough to make it into the dictionary. But they're so foul and filthy that it's turning the grass yellow as he yells at me and tells me to do more. Put, you know, I just couldn't handle. Well, when, when I was working with the Marines... Something that they told me was that the reason that the drill sergeants are, are, are monstrous assholes like that is so that the soldiers, so that the privates, the recruits, whatever you want to call them, start to fear him more than pain, more than the physical exertion, more than getting up early in the morning, more than climbing over the hill and all that. And they uh -huh. start to hate him and band together right. by that hate as a unit they're seeing somebody as an enemy. They're also getting past that innate fear for self-preservation that we all have. I fear my drill sergeant more than passing out from exhaustion on uh -huh. the field kind of thing. And to me, that was really, really interesting. And there were military dudes that would order us around and call us maggots and stuff like that. And they'd have to be taken aside and say, hey, you know, these guys aren't really in the military. You, you can't call him a bucket of crap. And then he'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. You're a bucket of pee. No, I, I, I don't know that we ever heard an I'm sorry and stuff. But I remember that we had to be up at five o'clock in the morning for a roll call for where we were all dressed and standing in formation. And we had a set line by 5 a.m. 
And yeah, that that's was another reason why that was practically impossible for me, <laughs> dude. I can't be at roll call at 10 a.m. And when we failed to do it like three times in a row, you know, there were still people staggering in at five. He was like, "Okay, enough of this easy horse shit. Tomorrow roll call is at 4:30 a.m." And that, and and so you know, it's just one of those things where it's like, "Wow, we're not even actual military guys, <laughs> and you're doing this to us." And yeah, but the, but there's something to be said for that fighting past exhaustion for pushing yourself farther than you think you can go for finding that you don't have limits or that you have limits beyond the limits and all that stuff. And I, and I think that that's probably a very attractive thing for a certain kind of person or maybe uh -huh. for all people to realize, Hey, I'm more than I thought I was. Right. Or I'm part of a team or look what we've accomplished. Who was it that used to say we accomplish more by 6 AM than most people do all day? Pretty sure that was the, an army slogan, but it, one of the branches of the armed forces. It I may well it have the been army. the chemo organization <laughs> that said that. I don't know. Just the military thing is romantic to me, especially World War II. But I would hate to ever have to be involved in it myself because I, I know my limitations and they are extensive. Is that mm. right? Okay. Uh, I don't know what John's background is or anything like that, but it is really, really interesting, this chemo stuff. And uh, thank you for sending us another story. Thank you for doing the rewrites on that. I don't know what condition that first draft was in, but sometimes it, it's hard to have somebody say, this doesn't make sense, or this goes on too long, or you misspelled this, or, or anything. When you've worked as hard as, as one has to, to write something, it might be tempting to just say, uh-huh, eat it. You're, <laughs> you're done. I'm not going to take your suggestions and all that. But thank you for playing along on that. And... Uh, it's a group effort here, you know. We got Perkins, we got Lincoln, we got <laughs> Sudden, we got you know just the team of our our own little chemo organization. I'm going to be quiet now, All so right. that you might talk. Okay, well, I will uh, send us off then. Thanks for listening, everybody, to the show. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll be back again next time. Maybe. See ya. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. My spirit was crushed when you discussed... Cats. Oh no. I continue to listen, hoping for something redeeming to emerge about your character, but thus far, spring 2009 issue, I remain disappointed. For the sake of mankind, I urge the robot to lobotomize both of you as soon as possible. I'll get right on it. Whoa, hey, no, OAOT, not yet. Alright, it's gonna have to wait at least a minute. Oh, come on. Thank you, Max. Uh, I've, I've just got two words for you. Like cats and dogs. I don't get it. Oh, I can't wait for him to hear that episode is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> he thought we were uh, sociopaths now. Just wait. <laughs> when the battle lose the war. Brian, I hope you will use that as the interstitial of each chapter. <laughs> the ten of us were so... Our number one goal is to further condition and win all the lot out of you. Our first chalupa... Win the battle, lose the war. Choice of evil lies before your feet. Get it out, son. Get it out. Well, wasn't this the story where all the guns always barked, or was that a different one? Oh, that was that was the steampunk one where all the guns barked. In this one, they burp. <laughs> Three rounds. Burp, burp, burp. <laughs> Do what you'd like with that, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Win the battle, lose the war. 
Ken turned, added his stomach contents to mine. Oops. Start over. You hit your mic and it went while you were doing that. No. Do it again. I cannot, sir. Yes, you can. Sir. Quit your crying and do it. <coughs> Don't backtalk me again. Slavering is a hard thing to do. I guess, you know, that, that one time at camp, but... This is the special needs section, I think. They keep all the child molesters. No, just in case he, he can't do it and has to leave yours in, is what I'm saying. Do a different voice from yours. That was different. Come yeah, on. That was very, yeah, well, that was different. Yes, I'll be more specific next time. <laughs> oh, okay. Win the battle, lose the war. Win the battle, lose the war. Win the battle, lose the war. Win the battle, lose the war, man. <laughs> Choice of evil lies before your feet. Within five minutes, frenzied meat and bone met riot shields. Five? We, I think, oh, why did I say five? It's not even there. Within five... <laughs> Damn it, five minutes. It's five minutes and I okay, say so. Okay, and so okay. I'm I'm in charge here. It always worked. And this was my first mission, so I would know. Oh, chingar. <laughs> Win the battle, lose the war. Win the battle, lose the war. I ran my hands, awkward as a high school boy's after prom over the body of my squad mate, squeezed his breast. Mmm, that's good stuff. I snatched when I felt, I snatched when I felt the sturdy metal tube of one of the guard's confiscated flashlights. I massaged the rubber nub, blinding myself in a new way. <laughs> this really is like a boy after prom. In the battle, lose the war. You are standing in the eye of the storm. Yeah, last year we did a story, Chemo, the Town of Golden Woods. This year we've got a prequel to that, Chemo, the Town of Golden Stains on the front of my undies. Oh dear. What's it called? It's called Chemo, the Condemned by J.M. Perkins. Do I, now, do I need to cut out that line about stains on the front of my undies? Yes, sir. J.M. Perkins previously appeared in Alien Skin Magazine and the Drabblecast on their Twitter fiction feed. The hell is that? That's those 100 oh, no, no. character stories. That's the Drabblecast. Right. Norm reads it. It's the Drabblecast, right? Right. It's not like he appeared only on the B-Sides podcast. Yeah. He wasn't slumming it or anything. Uh, R-O-E-D-O-T, can you cut out the slights against the most excellent Drabblecast B-Sides podcast? <laughs> if something looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and you have sex with it, my guess is that it's a duck. Wait. Uh, Sorry. O-E-D-O-T, if... please. <laughs>